I, I wonder what you think about this whole world of deep learning from a perspective of, of uh, theory. It, it, the, what, what do you make of this whole discipline of the success of neural networks, of how to do science on them? Are you excited by the possibilities of what we might discover about neural networks? Do you think it's fundamental in engineering discipline or is there something theoretical that we might crack open one of these days in understanding something deep about how system optimization and how systems learn? I am convinced by, is it Tegmark at MIT who's- Tegmark? Yeah, Tegmark, right? Yeah. So his notion has always been convincing to me uh, that the fact that some of these models are inscrutable is not fundamental to them. Hmm. And that we can, we're going to get better and better because in the end, you know, the, the reason why practicing computer scientists often who are doing AI or, or working at AI in industry aren't like worried about so much existential threats is because they, they see the reality is they're multiplying matrices with NumPy or something like right. this, right? Yeah. And and tweaking constants and hoping that the classifier fitness, yeah. for God's sakes, before the, the submission deadline actually yeah. like gets above some, like it feels like it's it's linear algebra and and tedium, right? Um, but anyways, I'm really convinced with his idea that once we understand better and better what's going on from a theory perspective, it's going to make it into an engineering discipline. So in my mind, where we're going to end up is, okay, forget these metaphors of neurons and these things are going to be get, get put down into these mathematical kind of elegant equations, differentiable equations that just kind of work well. And then it's going to be when I need a little bit of AI in this thing, uh, plumbing, like, let's get a little bit of a, a a pattern recognizer with a noise module and let's connect. I mean, I don't, you know this field better than me, so I don't know if this is like a reasonable a reasonable prediction, but that we're going to, it's going to become less inscrutable and then it's going to become more engineerable and then we're going to have AI and more things because we're going to have a little bit more control over how we piece together these different classification black boxes. So one of the problems, and th there might be some interesting parallels that you might provide intuition on is, you know, neural networks are very large and they have a lot of it, you know, we were talking about, <laughs> uh, you know, dynamic networks and distributed uh, algorithms. One of the problems with the analysis of neural networks is, uh, you know, you have a lot of nodes and you have a lot of edges. Yeah. To be able to interpret and to control different things is very difficult. There's uh uh, there's fields and trying to figure out like mathematically how you form uh, clean representations that are like, like one node contains all the information about a particular thing and no other nodes is correlated yeah. to it. So like it has unique knowledge yeah. and like, but that ultimately boils down to trying to simplify this thing yeah. into that goes against its very nature, which is like deeply connected and uh, like dynamic and just you know hundreds of millions, billions of nodes. Yeah. And in a distributed sense, like when you zoom out, the thing has a representation and understanding of something, but the individual nodes are just doing their little exchanging yeah. thing. And it's the same thing with Stephen Wolfram when you talk about cellular automata. It's very difficult to do math when you have a huge collection of distributed things each acting on their own. And it's almost like, it's, it feels like it's almost impossible to do any kind of theoretical work in the traditional sense. It almost becomes completely like a, like a biology, you become a biologist as opposed to yeah. a theoretician. You just study it experimentally. Yeah, I, so I think that's the big question, I guess, right? Yeah, is, so, so is the large size and interconnectedness of the, like a deep learning network fundamental to that task or are we just not very good at it yet because we're, yeah. we're using the wrong metaphor i mean the human brain learns with much fewer examples and and with much less tuning of the whatever 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 probably that requires to get those like deep mind networks up and running but yeah so i don't really know but the one thing i have observed is that the yeah there, there's a the mundane nature of some of the working with these models tends to lead people to think that well, to do it like eh, it could be skynet or it could be like a lot of pain to get you know the thermostat to do what we wanted to do. And there's a lot of open questions yeah. in between there. And then of course the at a distributed the distributed network of humans that use these systems. So like you can have the system itself, then the neural network, but you can also have like little algorithms controlling the behavior of humans, which is what you have with social networks. It's yeah. possible that a very what is it, a toaster or whatever, the opposite of Skynet 
when taken at scale, but used by individual humans and controlling their behavior can actually have the Skynet effect. Yeah. So the, the, the scale there- We might have that now. We might have that now. We just don't know. Yeah. Like, as it's happening. Is, is, is Twitter creating a little mini Skynet? I mean, is, yeah. it, because what happens, it twirls out ramifications in the world. And is it really that much different if it's a robot with tentacles or a bunch of servers that. Yeah. And the destructive effects could be, I mean, it could be political, but it could also be like, you know, you could probably make an interesting case that the virus, the, the coronavirus spread on Twitter too in the minds of people, yeah. like the, the fear and the misinformation in some very interesting ways yeah. mixed up. And maybe this pandemic wasn't sufficiently dangerous to where that could have created a weird like un un instability, but maybe other things might create instability. Like somebody, God forbid, detonates a nuclear weapon somewhere. And then maybe the destructive aspect of that would, would not as much be the military actions but the way those news are spread on Twitter yeah. and the panic that creates. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a great case study, right? Like what, what <laughs> happened, not, what, I'm not suggesting that, that Lexi go let off a nuclear bomb, I meant the coronavirus, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting case study. Um, I'm interested in the counterfactual of 1995, like yeah. do the same virus in 1995. So first of all, it would have been, I get to hear whatever, the nightly news, Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it, and then there'll be my local health board will talk about it. That mi mitigation decisions would probably necessarily be very sort of localized. Mm -hmm. Okay, our community is trying to figure out what are we going to do, what's going to happen. Like we see this with schools, like where, where I grew up in New Jersey, uh, there's very localized school districts. So even though they had sort of really bad viral numbers there, my school I grew up in has been open since the fall because it's very localized. Mm -hmm. It's like these teachers and these parents, what do we want to do? What are we comfortable with? I live in a school district right now in Montgomery County that's a billion dollar a year budget, 150,000 kid school district. It just can't, it's closed, you know, because it's it's too. So I'm interested in that counterfactual. Yes, yeah, so you have all this information moving around mm -hmm. and then you have the 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 effects on discourse that we were talking about earlier, that, that the, the Neil Postman style effects of Twitter, which shifts people into a sort of a dunk culture mindset of uh, don't give an inch to the other team and we're used to this and was fired up by politics and the unique attributes of Twitter, mm -hmm. now throw in the coronavirus and suddenly we see decades of public health knowledge, a lot of which was honed during the HIV e epidemic, was thrown out the window because a lot of this was happening on Twitter. And suddenly we had public health officials using a don't give an inch to the other team mindset of like, well, if we say this, that might validate something that was wrong over here. And we need to, if we say this, then maybe like that'll stop them from doing this. That's like very Twittery yeah. in a way that in 1995, it's probably not the way public health officials would be thinking. Or now it's like, well, this is, if we said this about masks, but the other team said that about masks, we can't give an inch. to this, So we got to be careful. And like, we can't tell people it's okay after they're vaccinated because that might, we're giving them an inch on this. And that's very Twittery in my mind, right? That is the the impact of, of Twitter on the way we think about discourse, which is a dunking culture of don't give any inch to the other team. And it's all about slam dunks where you're completely right and they're completely wrong. It's as a rhetorical strategy, it's incredibly simplistic, but it's also the way that we think right now about mm -hmm. how we do debate. It combined terribly with a election year pandemic. Yeah, election year pandemic. I wonder if we could do some smooth analysis. Let's run the simulation over a few times. A little bit see, noise, yeah. See, see if it can uh, dramatically change the behavior of the system. Yeah.